From the humble beginnings of a track coach looking for a competitive advantage to a worldwide conglomerate, let's take a look at the story of Nike. Okay, so in 1962, our buddy Phil Knight graduated from the University of Oregon. He got some odd jobs, went to the military, and ultimately moved back in with his parents. Once that drove him crazy enough, he decided to go back to school. Stanford Business School to be exact. So one day, in a class where he must invent a new business, he had an idea. Can Japanese athletic shoes do to German athletic shoes what Japanese cameras did to German cameras? Fast forward to graduation. While on a trip with some friends around the world, must be nice, right? He decided to grab a ticket to Japan. Once he got there, he found these dope shoes in a store, Tiger Shoes. Phil was able to land a meeting with Tiger and wowed them with his knowledge of the American shoe market, a market they were looking to get into anyway. They asked him what's the name of the company that he represents. He came up with Blue Ribbon Sports off the top of his head, told them that they were based in Portland, Oregon, and uh, yeah, they bought it. Phil went back to Oregon, grabbed the sample shoes he got shipped from Tiger, and beelines it for the best person he knew who knew about shoes. You see, back at U of O, Phil ran track. He wasn't great, but because he kind of sucked, that made him the perfect test subject for Bill Bowerman, a legendary track and field coach who was always looking for a competitive edge. Because you see, Bill had a habit of adjusting the shoes of his track stars. He tried to give them better cushioning, lighter weight, etc. Phil linked up with Bowerton to get his opinion of the shoes. After some tinkering, Coach was so impressed with Tiger's shoes, he decided to become partners with Knight. They both put up $500 of 1964 money, and Blue Ribbon Sports was born. Speaking of tinkering, funny story, Bowerton was watching his wife make breakfast one day and noticed the grooves in the waffle maker, and then boom, light bulb. It occurred to him that this waffle pattern would make a great multi-surface sole for a running shoe. So Bobby Boy grabs some plastic epoxy and uh, attempts to make a sole for his shoes. But he forgets the anti-sticking agent. He ruins the waffle iron and probably breakfast. But after a new waffle iron, a few more tries and most likely a night on the couch, he created a design that we still use today. Tons of people consider running for prolonged periods to be cruel and unusual punishment. Eventually, the higher-ups and Nike realized that it might be time to expand into different sports. If you're watching this on your phone, odds are that you were not alive in the 1980s, but back then, the NBA had not yet become the entertainment juggernaut that it is today. But Nike executive Sonny Vaccaro had a vision. Coming from a basketball background himself, Himself, he first approached the board of Nike about making a basketball shoe division. After much deliberation, engineering, and fine-tuning, the Air Force One was born. Sonny initially got the ball rolling on the basketball division by sponsoring college teams. You see, since this was long before the days of NIL deals, it was strictly forbidden to pay the players. But nobody said anything about coaches. Nike signed some of the top college coaches, like Jim Beheim and Jimmy Valvano, to endorsement deals and gave the players all the free shoes and swag the law would allow, a practice that still goes on to this day. Nike has always been ahead of the curve when it comes to marketing their product. And in 1984, they made their their most lucrative decision to date. Since their basketball division was doing so well, they decided to sponsor a player coming out of the 1984 NBA draft. You had a plethora of options for marketing with the characters coming out of that draft, but they ultimately decided to take a chance on the kid who had just come off of winning the NCAA tournament, a 6'6 shooting guard with a multi-million dollar smile named Michael Jordan. Nike took a huge gamble signing a college recruit who hadn't even taken a shot in the NBA game yet. But luckily for them, it paid off. And boy, do we mean paid. Everything about this campaign was new, innovative, and exciting. You see, the Jordan 1 was no regular athletic shoe. It was the first signature shoe for an athlete. So everything about it screamed Michael Jordan. Cool, attractive, fun, strong, and most importantly, exclusive. 
The Jordan 1 originally came in red, black, and white, Chicago Bulls colors, and the colorway was so different, the NBA actually banned them in the game, charging Jordan up to $5,000 per game for wearing them. Nike immediately started an ad campaign telling consumers to buy these new dangerous sneakers and happily paid Michael Jordan's fines. Before the Jordan 1, Nike did about 100 million in sales annually, and by the end of the first year of the Jordan 1, they sold 170 million. Of that sneaker alone, Nike capped production on the Jordan 1 to increase demand. They became the most sought after sneakers in the stores, and retailers couldn't keep them on the shelves. The demand for Jordan shoes got to such a fever pitch that people were actually committing acts of violence to get these shoes. When people are literally killing each other to get your product, I think it's safe to say you have a hit. Even today, the Air Jordan is the most popular sneaker in existence. Owning a pair of Jordans is a luxury, a rite of passage, and damn near an accolade. The shoes are the most collectible and resaleable shoes there are. Today, that iconic Jumpman logo rakes in a tasty $2.8 bubba billion dollars a year. And MJ? Yeah, he's doing all right. He owns his own NBA team now. Back in 1988, Nike got the ball rolling with its epic Just Do It campaign, including a commercial featuring 80-year-old running icon Walter Stack running across the Golden Gate Bridge. It was an in-your-face ad campaign that basically said, if this 80-year-old man is running 17 miles a day, what's stopping you? Just do it! Next year, Nike unveiled the Bo Nose campaign. Bo Jackson was a genetic freak. He was a human cheat code who played two sports professionally at the same time. Yeah, same time! The Bo Nose campaign was fun to watch as it listed off all the things Bo could do. Trust me, this was one of the catchiest catchphrases of the era. Since Bo was a multi-sport athlete, obviously he needed a multi-sport shoe. And that's where we get the cross trainer from. Now we have shoes for every sport and activity, even driving. Personally, I'm waiting for the Nike sleepers. Remember what Phil Knight and Bowerman paid to start the company? A total of $1,000 at the time of this recording. Um, Nike is currently valued at $197.7 billion. That's basically the GDP of Greece. And Nike is basically the go-to athletic shoe because they take up a crazy 62% of the worldwide athletic apparel market. Michael Jordan is still, still the biggest athlete Nike endorses. He's been retired for 20 years. Next on the list are Rory McIlroy, Tiger Woods, LeBron James, and Rafael Nadal. Over 100 million people buy Nike products every year to the tune of 780 million pairs sold per year. They sponsor camps, tournaments, benefits, and various charities. Although incredibly successful, things have not been all sunshine and rainbows for the boys at Nike. In 1996, Nike came under fire for their child labor practices after Life magazine reported that Nike had been operating sweatshops overseas and really sending the point home with a picture of a 12-year-old boy sewing a football. Nike initially denied any sweatshop shenanigans, claiming that they had little control over their foreign workshops. Even more recently, Nike signed possibly its most controversial athlete to date to an ad campaign. Former NFL quarterback Colin Kaepernick had been allegedly blackballed from the league for his silent protest of police brutality. Even though it's a quarterback's job to take a knee on the field, it had cost Colin his. Some of you probably remember that this controversy had the President of the United States weighing in on the issue. Nike took another gamble in signing and supporting Colin, rolling out a social justice campaign to help him fight for his cause. No matter what your athletic needs are, Nike more than likely has several ways to make sure you get the most out of every step. This company has become a cultural icon, changing the way that we look at sports, athletes, and footwear. And it was all started by two guys looking to win a few track meets. Do you remember your first pair of Nikes? Do you have a favorite style? What was your favorite commercial? Be sure to tell us in the comments below. Also, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share. Come on, just do it.